Well, uh, welcome back, everybody. So sorry uh, for the very brief break there, but uh, we've got uh, a lot more to cover today. So uh, moving into our next discussion uh, with Dr. Blanton, this lecture is entitled Archival Activism, the National Security Archive and the Freedom of Information Act. And it will be um, about you know, 40, 45 minutes and then uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes for, for questions. So from 12.30 until uh, 1.30. Um, so jot down your questions and be ready after uh, the end of the lecture. And once again, thank you very much, Dr. Blanton. I pass the microphone over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I would say not only think of your questions to ask, but think of what documents you would most like to get out of the United States government, because that's what we do, <laughs> is we file these thousands of freedom of information requests and declassification requests, and we open the secret files for all researchers, the public journalists, you name it. I just want to start with one of my favorite Freedom of Information Act results, because we've been talking about nuclear weapons, and it's a, the, we got back from a request we filed in 2006, and we got the full response after multiple appeals in 2015. So, don't have a lot of hope that you're going to get a response if it's about nuclear weapons to your freedom of information request in time for you to write your master's thesis, but maybe in time for your dissertation or, or maybe the book that you're going to write out of your dissertation afterwards, but it takes a while. But we got a stack, it was about 800 pages, Xerox, of a printout from the Strategic Air Command. And to my knowledge, it's the only nuclear war plan that has yet been declassified. And it was the Strategic Air Command plan that was in effect going into the Cuban Missile Crisis. They were the bombers. They were just getting missiles uh, into the arsenal, ICBMs. And this was done in, for 1959. And what was most remarkable for me was not so much seeing that there were gonna be 179 A-bombs and H-bombs dropped on Moscow in the event of hostilities. Think about that, 179 bombs. Think what one did to Hiroshima, right? But it was Moscow, so it was the center of all evil in the universe, so to speak. Uh, for these nuclear war planners. The most amazing one was East Berlin. There were 91 nuclear bombs targeted on East Berlin. It's as if no one told the war planners there's this place called West Berlin and a bunch of Americans are there, and some Brits, and some French, and they're our allies. And what's gonna happen when you got 91 bombs coming in on the East? And the more we looked into this war plan, the more you come to understand how the insanity of the nuclear arms race took place. These planners were working in a closed, hermetically sealed, top secret compartment code words as they're planning how to fight a war that would end human, human civilization as we know it. And they would get a new piece of intelligence. Oh, there's a railroad yard in this part of East Berlin. Let's put a bomb on it. Oh, there's a factory producing some steel elements for railroad cars. Oh, we got to put a bomb on that. Oh, we've just discovered that the Stasi have moved their headquarters out here in East Berlin further away. That's their intel. We have to put a bomb on that. So they accreted these levels of bombs to a level of true insanity. That's what drove those incredible numbers both in the Americans and the Soviets, that got us to, what was the peak number? 70,000, roughly, nuclear warheads, each bigger than, than the one that destroyed Hiroshima uh, in the world stockpiles. 
And I think that's partly what drove the Gorbachev and Reagan conversations, some knowledge of how crazy this was. But this war plan actually showed how they did it. And what we now know from the documents is there was no adult supervision <laughs> to nuclear war planning. It wasn't until the H.W. Bush administration in 1990 that civilians in the Pentagon were even allowed to see the ongoing war plan, the strategic uh, integrated operational plan. And, and the military guys on the joint staff planning group kept pushing back, no, 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 you're not, you're not cleared for that. There's some amazing stories about this that folks like Frank Miller and others tell of the civilians coming in and just asking basic questions. Wait a second, 179 bombs on Moscow after the third one, the bombs are blowing up each other as they land. That's, this is no way to run a war. So, but the, the whole process of trying to open those nuclear vaults takes so much time. That's really why the National Security Archive was invented. And I can tell you the Freedom of Information Act really only became effective after Watergate after these amendments passed in 1974, actually allowed for de novo review of classified information, actually made the law into an effective instrument for first for journalists, then for historians, and then even for citizens. And over that following about 10 year period, there was a flood of documentation that came out of the Freedom of Information Act. And the founding of the National Security Archive was at that 10 year mark in about 1985. Um, really, and there's two stories about our founding. One, these two journalists, Raymond Bonner of the New York Times and Scott Armstrong of the Washington Post, had each filed freedom of information requests about hugely controversial subject, the wars in Central America, specifically El Salvador. And Ray got one State Department cable with the top half blacked out as being still secret, except Scott got the same cable released, but with the bottom half blacked out. And when they put them together, you could actually read the whole cable. And what were they trying to hide? They were trying to hide this really uncomfortable fact that the death squads that were rampaging in El Salvador in the mid 1980s were being described by Washington policymakers as a bunch of extremist elements. But in fact, they were actually units of the army and the police force, which the American taxpayers were paying for about a billion dollars a year at that point, 1984, 1985. And so the idea that our money was gonna professionalize these security services was a real deep illusion. And the redactions were covering up that reality. And Ray and Scott together said, well, you know, we need to make a, an archive, but a kind of different kind of archive, an archive that would not just bring the documents together and preserve them, but keep pushing for more, keep going after new documents, filing new freedom of information requests, following up the ones that have been sitting there for 10 years, even bringing lawsuits under the law to force government agencies to release. And that was really our founding, the, the founding concept. It became reality I think when Scott Armstrong's spouse told him, get these documents out of my kitchen, they've taken over my entire kitchen table, you better create a non-governmental organization to house them, I don't want them in the house anymore. And so we were founded on a core family preservation, family values, that was the core of it. It was to prevent Scott from getting divorced and uh, We've been good for families, I think, ever since, especially now we're all teleworking from home and hanging out with our kids and our dogs and all that. But that story about those El Salvador documents came full circle last week because our senior analyst, Kate Doyle, who had worked on the Salvador materials way back when, helped the Salvador Truth Commission get American documents declassified. She was called to testify as an expert witness by the Spanish judge in this historic trial taking place in Madrid last week of the chief of staff of the Salvadoran army who gave the order for the murder 
infamous murder of the Jesuit priests at El Salvador, at the University of El Salvador in 1989. And what Kate's documents did was walk through how the army ran its death operations, where the orders came from, who was responsible, which units had been trained by the US military, how the process worked. So these documents were entered into evidence. They included the US State Department's reporting We've got to get the military first. We'll get the military to work with us to corral those rightist elements that killed the Jesuits. And within three months, the cables say, actually, it's the Salvadoran army that probably killed the Jesuits, and they're covering it up. And by the end of the year, they even have names. And some of these cables sent by the defense attaches are like firsthand evidence for the prosecution 30 years later of some of the most serious human rights abusers, not just the Jesuits, they ordered lots of other massacres, but there's finally an international court looking at it. The Jesuits were Spanish citizens, so the Spanish court has jurisdiction. So Kate testified by Zoom, authenticating the documents, explaining all the elements that you as a researcher have to do when you get a document, whether it's a nuclear war plan or a cable from San Salvador. It's, it's, you have to interrogate the document to get to the bottom of it. You know, who wrote it? Who were they in the scheme of things? Did they have power or were they a low level clerk? Who did they write it for? Who was supposed to read it? Who actually read it? Did, was it written before a decision took place or was it afterwards just to cover their rear end? Then who classified it? What made it sensitive at that time? Why was there a secret or a top secret stamp on it? Who declassified it? What became less sensitive later now that we're able to look at it? Uh, in my case with the nuclear war plan, it was that those war plans were no longer in effect by, the, by 2015. And it wasn't strategic air command delivering by bombs anymore. It's gonna be mostly missiles from Trident submarines and the like. But then who saved it? because most government records don't get saved. In fact, 90 something percent of them get thrown away. It used to be for space reasons. It's not a good reason anymore because you can save an infinite amount of material on thumb drives and so forth in the cloud. So, and then who, where did the document fit in any of these policy decisions? And did it make a difference? Or is it well written, but, nobody read it. All these pieces are what you have to ask of your evidence as you're going through this to say, um, did this matter? Did it make a difference? Or am I just quoting it because it's such a fun document, has great quotes, great evocative, or just has 91 bombs dropping on East Berlin. So I want to grab that factoid. That's terrific. So in the case of that nuclear war plan, it was the way we were going to bring human civilization to the end as of 1959 to 62. So we've done this kind of work, the filing of freedom of information requests for prosecutions of human rights abusers, for truth commissions, and for big historical projects. Um, there was this one moment, uh, this is on the Guatemala Truth Commission, where we got a document from a freedom of information request that was the American defense attache in Guatemala City writing back to Washington saying, the military has just heard there's gonna be a truth commission. So they've set up a hotline for everybody to call if the truth commission investigators come show up. And they've sent an order out to destroy all the records. And here's the Spanish language of the order and here's an English translation. And they've sent an order to pour concrete over all the clandestine cemeteries of all the detainees that they killed. Okay, we got that through freedom of information request. We gave it to the Guatemala Truth Commission. When they did their public report, there were some generals in the front row. They held up this declassified secret cable and pointed to it and said, the army destroyed most of the evidence. Here, here's a secret US document that shows their order to do so. That was on national television in Guatemala. And that afternoon, our partner in Guatemala, Helen Mack, amazing, woman whose sister had been killed by one of the death squads back in the 80s. She made it her lifetime cause to pursue those guys. And she gets a call at home and it's a sort of a deep and somewhat dark voice. And the voice says, I saw that 
order to shred the documents it was on tv today well i was one of the people who carried out that order but i saved a couple of items would you like to see them helen calls kate calls me we all think it this could be a setup who, who knows what is going on here he said okay meet the guy but in a public place sheraton hotel coffee shop this retired military guy comes in with a backpack and pulls a ledger, a little accounting ledger, a little bit bigger than a regular notebook, out of his backpack. Helen opens the pages, and in there are little biographies of suspected guerrillas, leftists, union organizers, university professors, um, and young activists. And next to each bio was a photograph that clearly of that person clearly cut out of their identity card. It took us three months to authenticate this thing. It turned out to be a productivity report from a death squad. When they killed one of these people, they cut out their ID card and taped it onto the page. It's an extraordinary document that just reeks of murder. It took us weeks to figure it out. We cross-tab with press reports, with missing person reports. 183 people are in this book, The Death Squad Diary. For most of their families, getting this thing published was the first time they knew what had happened to their loved one. Their father or mother had gone off to the university that morning to teach and never came home. Body was never found. And this book documented what happened to them. Um, later on in a trial, the judge asked the question, well, why would this unit keep this kind of thing? And it reminded me of those interviews, I think Gitta Salini did with the, the former Nazis after World War II, and she asked them, why would you keep all those records from the death camps of, of people that you killed and how many people came in on the train and how many people um, did you separate out to be uh, laborers? And, and the general answer was, if we did not keep records, then we're just murderers. But by keeping records, we can be national defenders of the national security of our country. We can be part of a state apparatus. We are following orders. We are saluting. Records is what effectively lets us look ourselves in the mirror. Horrifying to me, but this is the kind of evidence the army had shredded. And we got it because of this leveraging effect. A good freedom of information request, a cable declassified written by a defense attache, truth commission use, and then the appearance of this death squad diary. It's now the subject of ongoing um, human rights prosecutions in the Inter-American Human Rights Court in Costa Rica. It just, it's a, it's an amazing, in many ways, story because it also implicates the United States. This unit, this death squad was set up, it's actually called the Archivo. <laughs> it was set up in the 1960s by United States advisors in Guatemala helping them create lists of leftists and opponents of the regime. And by the late 1970s, it had morphed into an actual killing machine with the black glass and the Jeep Cherokees. And the unit was based, believe it or not, in the presidential guard in the presidential palace. So um, we think we've got it bad when they send uh, Secret Service agents out to clear Lafayette Park in Washington, D.C. with tear gas. Um, they haven't yet started uh, shooting those protesters, but um, that's to me one of the dramas of our freedom of information request, what we've opened up over the years. There have been many others that are just pushing the history and, and sort of bringing new narratives. There was one of my favorite moments took place at a conference table in Havana, Cuba, when we presented, we were trying to do that leveraging thing. We presented Fidel Castro with about 20,000 pages of declassified American documents, transcripts of the Kennedy tapes, 
documents about mongoose and the assassination operations against Castro. We did this big presentation kind of saying, without explicitly saying it, here's ours, where's yours? There was an implicit threat. We're gonna tell the story of the Cuban Missile Crisis based on our evidence. So if you don't put your evidence on the table, Cuba's role, Cuba's voice will be left out. And it was like all this flashes through Castro's head. And it was the first time in my life I've ever felt sympathy, empathy for a dictator, but he does this. And he snaps his fingers. And from the back of the conference room, these three burly guys, bodyguards, come out carrying boxes, our banker's boxes, on their shoulders. And they plop them on the table in front of Castro. And he opens up the cardboard and he's sort of thumbing through the little files there and he's, oh yes, here's the letter that Khrushchev wrote to me apologizing for pulling out the missiles without even talking to me first. And he starts reading from it. Oh, my dear Fidel, you're young and passionate. And I know you're really angry, but please come see me in Moscow. The snow is falling on the birches and we can talk it out. We can make up. It's really... Historians had no idea. Think about the missile crisis. It had been studied in this way for how many decades? Who knew, right? And so Castro throws it on the table and he sees everybody just like, ah, I want to get that. And he's really enjoying himself. And he says, ah, yes, this declassification stuff, it must have something to do with the class struggle. This is Castro. So great moments. And the documents over time really turned the narrative of the Cuban Missile Crisis on its head. If you look back to the literature of 1963, 64, 65, the Arthur Schlesinger book where he talks about John F. Kennedy's brilliant brinksmanship, el escalating the pressure little bit by little bit until what was Dean Rusk's great phrase, we went eyeball to eyeball with the Russians and they blinked, right? Turns out that's an absolute and total myth. <laughs> Kennedy blinked too. The documents show both Khrushchev and Kennedy were extraordinarily reckless and aggressive beforehand. Kennedy with the assassination plots against Cuba, against Castro, plans for an invasion, the constant sense of threat. We talked a little bit about that with Gorbachev and Reagan. Khrushchev was reckless because he said, I'm looking across the Black Sea and they got missiles in Turkey. I'm going to put a hedgehog in their pants. That's the quote from his son-in-law by putting our missiles in Cuba. Recklessness. And not only that, the Soviet operational plan. This is one of the documents we leveraged because we got declassified the American intelligence material and General Gripkov said, oh, well, they didn't get it. The Americans only spotted about 10,000 Soviet troops. We actually actually had 40,000. And here's the, and by the way, we also had tactical nuclear weapons with them. And Robert McNamara goes, tackle nuclear weapons, are you kidding? Here's the Joint Chiefs of Staff arguing in favor of an invasion of Cuba. If there had been an American invasion of Cuba, tactical nuclear weapon would have taken out the whole invading force. We're talking tens of thousands of casualties. And if they used tactical nukes, our doctrine was, we had some tactical nukes on our aircraft carriers, we'd use tactical nukes back. And first thing you know, you're talking about the Caribbean as a smoking, radiating ruin and potentially a world conflict. Just the level of recklessness all around. And yet when I say they blinked, the documents show that from the very first days of the crisis, John F. Kennedy is the one person in the room saying, I don't wanna invade Cuba. If we can get those missiles out by diplomacy, this is a quote from the tapes, we won't have a very good war if people find out we could have gotten them out through diplomacy, right? And on the other side, Khrushchev, when he first gets the word, Kennedy's speech on October 22nd, 1962, Khrushchev's first reaction is to turn around every one of the Soviet ships that had not yet gotten through this announced blockade line. So both sides start blinking and blinking rapidly to de-escalate. And at the same time, there's so much already happening, already deployed. You got the 
military is on high alert. So when a U-2 plane goes missing over Siberia, the U.S. Air Force scrambles planes out of the Alaska Air Base. And under the wings of each one of those F-104s are two air-to-air -air nuclear missiles, right? To blow up incoming fleets of Soviet bombers. Or on the way to Cuba, four diesel Russian submarines. Each one of them had been given a nuclear torpedo. How do you have any command and control when the, when the submarine is out of contact with Moscow? And you got the Americans dropping little depth charges on them, right? I mean, this is a, the sense that both Kennedy and Khrushchev got, that we can see it in the transcripts of the tapes and we can see it in the, in the Politburo notes, is things were out of control and they had to de-escalate, cut a deal. Bobby Kennedy ultimately cuts a deal with Dobrynin. Later on, Dobrynin actually confronts uh, Ted Sorensen. Sorensen wrote Robert Kennedy's memoir and kind of downplayed this secret deal business. And Dobrynin gives Sorensen a copy of Dobrynin's cable back to Moscow, where he says, I tried to give Bobby this letter spelling out the deal we just made. And Bobby read it, handed it back to me and said, no, this can't be in our files. It would be bad for my political career. Literally, that's in Dobrynin's Cable to Moscow. It's just an amazing story. And yet the myths of this calibrated brinksmanship, this pressure, led directly into the escalation of the war in Vietnam and all the other kinds of, oh, we can bring greater pressure on Pyongyang and it'll get them to give up their nukes, even though at this point today, their nukes are kind of an insurance policy for their continued existence. And so ratcheted brinksmanship doesn't work. We now know, and the documents now show us how American policymakers fooled themselves uh, and the secrecy helped fool the rest of us. So it was a tangible price with the escalation in Vietnam and elsewhere. Um, let me talk of a couple more dramas because we've used freedom of information requests to go after these big pockets of secret documents. Nuclear weapons is one huge pot. Another big pot is the intelligence world where it's just uh, allergic to oversight and accountability. It takes whistleblowers and leakers like Edward Snowden to actually give us a real window into how the intelligence community works. But one of our pockets of real secrecy in this country are grand jury records. Grand juries are the bodies that bring indictments and charges against potential criminals, and their records are sealed um, in order to protect witnesses, to protect potential folks who did not get charged. So the grand jury didn't charge against them. Very few cases do these records get released, but we thought it was important to go back and revisit some of the most famous cases. Everyone's heard of the Rosenberg spy case. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were killed in the electric chair, chair in the state of New York in the early 1950s. And we, under some strange circumstances, you had from the left, there was this whole criticism, oh, they've been framed by the prosecution, they're really innocent. And from the right, you had, oh, this was a Soviet spy ring that was doing real damage, including the secret of the atomic bomb, right? And when we get the grand jury records released, and it took a lawsuit and, and, and citing the, the freedom of information laws, we find out that both those arguments were correct. The documents show Julius was actually running a real spy ring. It was probably more effective on industrial spying, things like radar, than it was on the, on the A-bomb. But that Ethel, his wife, was in fact framed. And she was framed by her brother, <laughs> which is, adds whole other levels of drama and dimension. Her brother's testimony to the grand jury was, Oh, Ethel didn't have anything to do with it. It was actually my wife who typed up all the notes for Julius. The prosecutor said, well, that's not going to help us. We're trying to put pressure on Julius to confess. So we got to keep the charges against Ethel. So her brother changed his testimony at the trial to protect his wife and fry his sister. Brings new meaning to the phrase brotherly love, right? So, and the prosecutors knew this. So in fact, they were framed and they were running a spy ring, or Julius was. 
So you get these much more nuanced with the documentary evidence, much more nuanced, much more complex, and I would even argue more dramatic stories once you actually, once you have the real evidence. Um, I'll give you one more story, and then I'd love to take your, your own questions about going after the archives. So um, Henry Kissinger stole all of his office files when he left the State Department in the early 1977. And first he put them at the Rockefeller Estate, Pocanico Hills in New York, until his personal lawyers told him that the government could maybe prosecute him for theft of government property. And so he should come up with a different option. So he approached the Library of Congress and said, if I give my papers to you, would you agree to a seal, a total deed of gift? Would it, they make them all sealed for perpetuity, right? Until, you know, I pass away and my heirs can grant access. And the Library of Congress, so eager to get it, said, sure, sure, sure. So got them under seal. A um, bunch of journalists brought a lawsuit. This can't be legal. Um, but the Supreme Court threw it out because the journalists didn't really have standing under the laws at the time. But in the decision, Justice Stevens actually said, it looks like Dr. Kissinger is putting his files at Library of Congress to keep them away from the reach of the Freedom of Information Act because FOIA does not apply to the Congress. So years later, our staff, great Bill Burr, finds copies of some of Kissinger's documents, the transcripts of his meetings with Mao Zedong and with Leonid Brezhnev in his assistance file. So Winston Lord had been the aide who took the notes in the Mao Zedong meeting. And so in Winston's file, he had a copy of those Mimcons. And so Bill gets those documents out and he finds similar set in Helmut Sonnenfeld's files of the Brezhnev materials. And so he puts them together in a book called the Kissinger Transcripts. And in the introduction, we write an introduction that says, unfortunately, the official record of all this is locked away and Kiss illegally in Kissinger's files at Library of Congress. Kissinger's lawyers wrote us a nasty letter you're defaming us. You're defaming my client by claiming that he stole that property and that it's illegally at the Library of Congress. He was deemed by the Supreme Court to have total rights to all that. That didn't sound quite right to us. It actually made us to go back and read the Supreme Court decision. And we found Justice Stevens' little comment, hmm, looks like he's going there to hide this stuff from the Freedom of Information Act. So we say, hmm, maybe we should not, we can't sue Kissinger because Supreme Court said didn't have standing, but we should sue the State Department because they should never have let him steal that stuff. They abdicated their duty under the records laws to save those records. And so we got a pro bono law firm and we wrote up a draft complaint. We sent it as a courtesy to the State Department legal advisor. And the next day we get a phone call. Could y'all come in and chat? Before you file this case, we go in, we're sitting in the office of William Howard Taft IV. You know, this is a guy whose grandfather had been a president, another guy had been Chief Justice Supreme Court. He's the legal advisor under George W. Bush. And Taft says to us, I've been reading your complaint and I actually think you may be right as a matter of law, but would you do me the courtesy of not filing the lawsuit until I have a chance to write to Dr. Kissinger? because we may be able to settle this thing without litigation. And our lawyers say, can we go out in the hall and have a little chat about this? We go out in the hall and our lawyers say to us, this is great, because if he's gonna write to Kissinger and Kissinger says no, we can get a copy of that letter and put it in the court file. And then we've got the judge, the State Department, all on our side, we'll win. We said, okay, all right, we'll hold off. We won't file the complaint. Go ahead and write Dr. Kissinger. And I think when that letter came into Kissinger's office, he showed it to his law firm. Law firm looked at it and said, OMG, State Department says we're wrong. Uh-oh, yeah, you better agree. And so Kissinger cuts a settlement and these documents come in and we start going through them and pulling other of the, especially the Chinese material. So this is great. So we have a colleague Chinese American professor, teaches at University of Virginia, but he goes back to Shanghai every summer and teaches at Shanghai Normal. So he took a set of these Kissinger China transcripts. It's like what Zhou Enlai said, what Mao said. He took them with him back to Shanghai and he gives a lecture every summer at the Foreign 
Ministry Institute, where they train their diplomats. And so our friend Chen Jin does this lecture about the brilliant Kissinger and Nixon diplomacy that led to the opening to China. And the foreign ministry guys say, you know, we, we teach that a little differently. Really, is that right? Yes, we have a case study here of all the documents, all the times we tried to reach out to the Nixon administration and they totally missed the signals. This is the study by the four marshals that gave to Chairman Mao in 1969, saying we got these border clashes with the Soviets, so we should reach out to the far barbarians to counteract the near barbarians, right? In other words, the Chinese teach this history as their brilliant diplomacy suckering Nixon and Kissinger into coming to China and paying tribute to the emperor. I mean, Mao didn't go to Washington. The Americans came to him. There's even instructions in the foreign ministry case study of how many steps Nixon should take from the foot of the airplane ladder to where Cho and Lai is standing with his hand outstretched to replicate the march of a barbarian chieftain in the 11th century coming to pay tribute to the emperor. Now, this was totally over all the Americans' heads, but most of the Chinese knew their history. Oh, that's what we're seeing here, right? And, and you look at the outcomes afterwards, and it's, you know, who got their legitimacy restored after the tragedies of the Cultural Revolution? Who's still, who's still in power today? The Communist Party of China, right? What happened to Nixon? Within two years, he's impeached and resigned. Right? It, it's a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating new window. The documents make you look at things, look at even received notions from the other side, which is really the very first obligation of any foreign policy analyst, any scholar, any diplomat. And I'll finish with one of my favorite documents. After the fiasco in Iraq, when the Iraq study group showed there was no weapons of mass destruction, all those programs were defunct as of the mid 1990s uh, when Saddam's son-in-law defected. There was really no mushroom cloud anywhere on any horizon. And to the great credit of the CIA analysts, they did an internal, I call it the mea culpa series, a, a series of papers on how we could be so wrong. And my favorite one is the 16th in the series. They take each of the key issues, yellow cake, rumors, um, the uranium enrichment tubes, all the different allegations that were, drove the front pages and the whole discourse that led to the invasion of Iraq and the incredible tragedy that that became. The 16th one in the CIA series was about Saddam Hussein's deceptions how he had misled this batch of inspectors, how he had lied about this, how he had deceived there. And the analysts say, we always took his deceptions as evidence that he was hiding something, not hiding nothing. He's hiding something. The next sentence, we never put ourselves in the shoes of a paranoid dictator living in a dangerous neighborhood who might want to deceive everyone into thinking he had weapons of mass destruction. It's an amazing mea culpa. I just hope that those analysts inside the CIA today are providing that kind of put yourself in the other shoes on North Korea, on Iran. I'm not sure their higher ups want to hear any of it. I mean, you got to read the John Bolton book and see genuine craziness at work, not just among his boss, but in his own head. I mean, the real, ultimately, the, the times in the Bolton book when President Trump actually looks pretty good is when Bolton is arguing for a military strike on Iran that would lead to a wider Middle East war. And Trump says, mm, no, I'm not really sure I want to, I want to do that. Bolton denounces him for that. Uh, I don't know, sounds kind of reasonable to me. One of the more rational things that have come out of that chaotic mind of the president. But it's a 
fascinating when you get into the documents and you get at that underlying evidence and you put yourself in the shoes of the other, you're a long way ahead in your analytical work, your scholarly work, and I hope in your careers. So I'd love to take your questions. I can talk for hours. We have 30 other big projects.